Hello, uh, my name is Stuart Brown. I'm the Head of Programme and Acquisitions at the BFI in London and the UK. And um, I had the great pleasure of curating the season that's happening at ACME. And I should probably say as well that I acquired County Lines for release in the UK. Uh, and it's been a really important part of British film culture here in the last couple of years and a really, really important part of the work of the BFI. Um, without further ado, I'm going to welcome our special guest, the director of County Lines, Henry Blake. Hello, everyone. Good, Henry. Good, mate. How are you? I'm all right. Thanks. Very well. Very well. Very happy to be doing this with you. Yes, thank you for having me and, and thanks for acquiring the film. It's absolute pleasure. Ab absolute pleasure. Um, as you know, we've discussed many times in the past, I saw the film uh, during the London Film Festival immediately got onto it, wanted to work with it. It felt important and um, moving and all of the things that I think cinema can do, it did to me. Um, I think I, I was wondering for the audience in Melbourne who've just seen the film, maybe if you could talk to us um, about the phenomenon that is County Lines, because I, I honestly don't have much of an idea whether something similar exists there or whether this is a, a new concept for people in Australia, but obviously in the UK, it's kind of part of our lives in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could just kind of give us a description based upon your real life experience of it. Of course. Um, so county lines is the term uh, which has come in very much into the consciousness, the British consciousness over the last, I would say, uh, 10 to 15 years, especially in the last five years, it's really ramped up that term and the headlines. And what it uh, refers to are national drug distribution lines that are ruthlessly organized and very sophisticated and run by um, many criminal networks. Um, the drugs, the main two drugs that are trafficked are crack cocaine and heroin. And one of the devices to traffic, one of the most commonly used devices to traffic those drugs are children. And so over the last decade, um, <clears throat> uh, export towns or cities such as London and Liverpool have become uh, oversaturated. The drugs markets have become oversaturated and what criminal networks have done in a very sort of entrepreneurial way, an imaginative way, is extend their drug distribution lines outside of those cities. And those lines now span the whole of the UK. Obviously, with expansion comes more need to uh, traffic the drugs, to move them. And that's where children, a lot of the time children who either come from low socioeconomic status uh, who have been expelled or removed from mainstream education and they go through a grooming process and then they are traffic, trafficked out of their home area and can be trafficked at uh, very, very large distances. Um, and one of the, the key component with county lines really is the exploitation component. That's what makes it so dangerous and so traumatizing is that children as, long, as young as 10 can be groomed and then they'll be exploited and they can be sent as far away. I've worked with a boy who was trafficked from East End London to Aberdeen in Scotland. And over the course of that trip uh, was physically abused um, and had and saw some terrible, terrible things. So it's a unique scenario that uh, I think is is got to a stage which you just said, Stuart, which has unfortunately become pretty commonplace. Yeah, and when you say um, you've worked, maybe you could explain what 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 you do um, when you're not directing films and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and what your what your journey was into making County Lines as a, as a feature. So. Alongside my filmmaking for the last 11 years, I was a youth worker in London, working with very, very vulnerable children, aged from about eight years old all the way up to 18. Uh, and I was 
going all over different boroughs, doing that one-to-one mentoring, um, trying to re-engage young people who had been uh, taken out of mainstream education. And through that work in 2015, I was working with two groups of children in an educational facility known as a, a PRU, a pupil referral unit, who were being exploited and trafficked via County Lines criminal networks. So obviously, over the last 10 years, you, as a filmmaker, you're working on projects, you're developing, um, but at the same time, you have to pay the rent. And youth work was paying the rent, but it also afforded me this very tough but fascinating insight into really another world and a, and a, and a different Britain, you know, a Britain that uh, on some levels was being neglected and uh, didn't really have any sort of authored voice yeah, to it, yeah. certainly within cinema. I think that's quite an important thing um, to understand is that County Lines had been at least my experience was it had been kind of reported a bit in the media here. Um, actually, most reference to reference to it that when I saw the film that I recognised was actually from UK hip hop or grime because mm-hmm. it's quite a big subject matter or reference point within a lot of those tracks. Mm-hmm. And that's like, and that's kind of how I latched on to what it was. Um, and so. When we released the film over here, a big part of the release was about awareness raising, wasn't it? It was to try and get as many eyeballs as possible on this and to, I guess, to use it as a sort of activism, a kind of social campaign to try and um, get some more coordinated work done in in the various police forces up and down the UK on this. Mm. Um, Yeah, Mark Commode referred to the film as a sort of it, it, you know, it's a, it's an authored piece of cinema, but at the same time, it's like a public service announcement, <laughs> which I think is a really nice way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a sort of wake up, and it, there's definitely a kind of thing where there's a feeling that it's a taboo as well, because if you look at the numbers of people who are affected by this, it's a really massive, massive number of people. If you th- the extended kind of yes. The, the, the kind of the victims, then yes. their immediate family, then their wider circles. Um, yes. And I think people just are very reluctant to talk about it. And, and yes. hopefully the, the film and the release have, um, have changed that to, to some degree. Yeah, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable truth, especially when you're dealing with children. And the, this is also British children who are being exploited, um, really heavily exploited. And safeguarding communities across the UK are really struggling with the scale and depth of trauma that those children are exhibiting uh, once they return home. So it's been a huge, huge undertaking for the safeguarding communities. It's also exposed massive weaknesses in security force communities and safeguarding practices because you've got children who are who are going cross boundary, sometimes multi cross boundaries. And so on a bureaucratic level, who is responsible for that child? Um, And obviously, the first answer there is the parents. But what do you do when a child who has been exploited via county lines doesn't have parents or is in a foster home or is in a care home? or another sitting like that. Um, So it's a massive, massive challenge and it has essentially changed uh, as of this year. It's changing the architecture of safeguarding practice in in the UK and we've never had anything like that. I mean, the, the, the other, probably the other massive structural safeguarding issue that we had was Rotherham, where the girls were sexually abused, but County lines is bigger than that. Yeah. You know? They're, they're very interesting in relation to one another in terms yes. of problems this, this country has been dealing with in, in the recent period. Um, I want to bring it back to identity. Um, mm-hmm. The season we're presenting at ACME is, is part of a wider UK, Australia kind of cultural exchange season mm-hmm. across lots of different art forms. And we were asked to respond to uh, provocation, which is who are we now? Um, and so 
I hope that me and my co-curator Nia Childs uh, have put a season together that answers that in some way mm -hmm. uh, or presents um, collectively a kind of idea of Britishness which is uh, authentic and, and, and real. Um, viewers in Melbourne might have noticed your accent. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly have been more aware of it in this session than I have in once in the past. <laughs> so I, I wonder if we can, can I ask you about your identity um, and how Britishness is, is part of that? Mm -hmm. So I grew up in New Zealand, in Wellington and Tauranga, and uh, I'm first generation New Zealand. So my, my parents are from Britain and immigrated over to the country in the 70s, I believe. Um, and then I'm a child of the 80s. Uh, so it's an interesting one because it was a wonderful, wonderful upbringing. You know, it's outdoorsy and there was lots of sport and a lot of physical freedom and very safe. Uh, but I grew up in a really, with a really strong flavor of British and Britain. You know, I, I always remember the BBC News being on, Casualty, The Bill, Harry Enfield, Mr Bean, um, Kevin and Perry Go Large, uh, Faulty Towers, and a lot of British literature as well. So I was, it was funny, and I spent many holidays over here. So it's not unfamiliar for me, and, and a lot of my family, um, my grandparents onwards are British. Um, so it's always felt like home. And when you were writing and, and putting the film together, particularly casting the film, yeah, did you have a feeling of um, uh, a, a kind of British cinema, or was it was that was it more laser focused on the subject matter at hand? I had a sense of what had come before, and you can have a very strong sense of what has come before with whatever film you make, but at some point in the process, you have to, you have to do you, you know? And I, because of my relationship with the subject matter, which I always describe this film as a diary entry, because it's so personal and, and the characters are so personal and, and very painful. Uh, I was never looking in the rear view mirror at the, at the, at those, maybe more presumed references you know and the reason i ask about the casting um I'm, I'm, i'll ask about the performances which are extraordinary in a second but if you look at the cast it it is in itself very multicultural mm -hmm. um what was that from the outset um an important uh part of the the, the story making process or was that was that just an accident of casting or or the way you conceive the, the story was was that kind of already in there no it was a very I, I i wanted the film in its casting to direct to reflect my work as a youth worker right. you know turning up uh every single day you're walking into rooms that you haven't been before and you see such an eclectic and meet such an eclectic mix of young people and professionals um and there had been this very tired and lazy uh stereotype up until 2015 that county lines was could be attributed to one community i.e the black community and my my experience of it working with children was was far broader than that and so i wanted the film to reflect a much wholesome inclusive uh fabric of yeah. britain and the the, the performances that you, you, you've managed to um, get from the cast, that you've, the brilliant cast that you've got, are, are really extraordinary. I remember it, I remember it knocking my socks off. I, 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 I'd never heard of Conrad before, and mm -hmm. I, I immediately got out and started Googling Conrad Khan. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, but not just Conrad, across the board, I think that the performances are, are really, really extraordinary and powerful. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit um, from from the perspective of being a director, what what was your method and and how did you how did you get everyone onto that frequency which is there in the film? I think with Conrad, we cast him 
a good year before we were shooting and him and I would just meet up maybe once every two weeks and I would just send them, you know, send them away with questions. You know, it was very gentle work. Um, I think with an actor like that who has a huge degree of sensitivity, you don't want to micromanage them, but you also don't want to dump a, a dossier of, of prep because they can become, you know, it can become a burden. So it was very gentle work and then trying to create a relationship with deep trust because obviously there was a big responsibility there. Yeah. With someone like Ashley, Ashley Medekwe, who plays Tony, his mother, she had a very, very clear in from reading the script, which, which was, you know, her mother. And having grown up in South London, she had a really strong sense of what this was. My main note to her with Tony was dignity, you know, was we can take her through the ringer, but I want her to have dignity at all times. And then with Harris Dickinson, it was again sort of just meeting up and talking about his life simon's life outside of him grooming young people and actually having a whole other identity if you like so it was just about creating well-rounded approaches and not being too heavy-handed as a director because i think sometimes that can go against you you know yeah i spend my time doing this most of the time Stuart let's let's go again but just less <laughs> that's a, like that's you know, advice the, for the visual languages <laughs> yeah you just because when you when you author a really strong visual language and a visual philosophy then part of the a lot of the time with the actors you're saying look you don't need to do all the work i'm doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you yeah you know? well it's i have to say um for my money the the performances make the film is absolutely uh extraordinary um again just thinking about this the season um as a kind of collective thing that we put together mm -hmm. uh, i wanted to ask you about your um do you feel part of a kind of community of filmmakers or creatives in the uk is is there a sense of um some sort of sense of community of practitioners I think with it's interesting because I didn't before with county um, before county lines, you know, and that was purely because of what I did with youth work and I hadn't been to film school and none of the short films that I made were successful. So I was very much, you know, darting around the city trying to get my filmmaking activated. It's interesting the year that we are included in and many of the films, the 2019 2020 year which a lot of them are in this season, we, it has been a sense that we are part of a, a similar, a, a, well, not a similar approach, but, you know, a sort of a new voice of British cinema coming through. And I would say, you know, the BFI and, and your work has really made me feel that as well. So it's nice to know that there are other people out there making similar work or, or, or at least have a similar intensity in their work. Um, so I would say yes, you know, but I very much keep to myself quite deliberately in terms of the, the industry. You know, I, I'm quite obsessive when working on something and, and I'm not much used to anyone else at networking events, et cetera. <laughs> so, I just crack on with the work and I think that's the most important thing really. We can work on that together. Yeah. <laughs> um, just leading on from that, I, I wonder um, in terms of where British cinema is at, at the moment, do, do you, is there anything that you've been particularly inspired by or is there anything you think might be missing from our national cinema? Do you, do you have any sort of strong feelings about where we are going or where we should be going or do you just like focus on your creative practice and, and get on with that um i i would say for the most part i probably just focus on my creative practice but what i would say is that there's been some like there's been some amazing films over the last like from bait mark jenkins bait 
and then Rose Glass of St. Maud, um, Aleem's, Aleem Khan's After Love. Uh, there's another couple there, excuse me for, for forgetting, but those are three that I think, if you were to look at those, I mean, that's, that's super exciting work. And what I would say about them, if you were to look at all three of them, is that the central performances of them are extraordinary. And so I would say it's in really good health. You know, and for me, acting is, it's really important that the performances are really strong. And I think there's filmmakers out there now who, who are getting incredible performances. You know, Morford Clark is incredible in St. Maud. Yeah. yeah. Um, Joanna, Joanna Scanlon in yep. After Love. Yep, she's nominated for a BAFTA, which is in a couple of Sunday's time. So we'll all be... And, and Mark's just... Mark is just doing such an original and really important style of cinema, which is not London, it's Cornish, and, and performances are there are reflecting that sort of anthropo anthropological approach, which I love. So I'd say it's in really good health, man. Like, yeah. I think, I think that those of us in the industry, I think we feel we're in a, an interesting moment for national cinema. Really? Um, my own feeling having being a bit of a veteran of the industry now is that um, for a really long time people talked about the need to diversify the need for more voices to come through the need for more women to be making mm -hmm. decisions in filmmaking processes whether that's mm -hmm. writing or directing or, or, or other um Absolutely. and i feel like there was lots and lots of talk but i do feel like the last five six years changes started to happen and it does yes. feel like now we've got a kind of um a richer and more representative kind of national um cinema which is probably reflecting life in the uk better than it used to yes i think i think there's always a long way to go with those things the work is never done and hopefully we're on a trajectory now where that's gonna you know keep changing and we're gonna yes. be welcoming uh a wider multiplicity of voices in, into the um, into the frame, as it were. Yeah. Um, I think we're out of time, Henry. Okay. Uh, I want to say thank you to you for giving us your time and talking about your brilliant film, County Lines. Well, thank um, you. I want to thank our friends and colleagues at Acme for working with us on the project. We're looking forward to the season that they bring to the BFI in London, which will be happening later this year. So. Maybe you can come down to the BFI and watch some of the films that you put on for us. I absolutely, I'm a huge fan of Australian cinema. One of my um, favourite, favourite, favourite films of all time is um, Wake and Fright. Oh, great film. Which oh, I think is just, I, 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 bought, I, got, I bought the kind of new, they re-released it after Cannes because it played in Cannes a few yeah, years ago. The restoration, I, I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I bought the restoration. And I mean, that that's, that is a great, great film well i think the season that they do for us will be in september so so come down definitely going to catch it thank you stuart thanks henry good to see you thanks see you soon yeah. take care thank you everyone bye see you